Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we're so thankful this morning, Lord, for this beautiful congregation on this beautiful day. God, we give you honor and thanks for the beautiful facilities that you've afforded us to worship in. And Lord, we plead your blood over our mind, our soul, our very bodies, God, that you would use us today for your glory, God. Stand up in us. Speak the word of God with boldness. In Jesus' name we pray, Lord. We're going to give you the glory and the honor. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Oh, let's clap our hands and shout yes to the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory. Well, I did that good. You may be seated. I am uh, I'm using a new machine today, so you may have to help me out a little bit. I'm going to try to. I haven't preached with this one yet, so we'll see how it works. But it's good to be with you today. God bless you. God bless you so much today. I, uh, I have a verse of scripture we're going to go to today. And we'll begin here. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 26. It's not a strange place. It is a very common scripture. It's well known, well versed, well trafficked. I'm sure you've heard many sermons launched from this launch pad. It simply says, be ye angry and sin not. As if God is suggesting to us, He needs us to get mad. Come on, let, let your blood boil a little bit. Engage. Now, that's not what He's telling us. What He's telling us is, anger is a reality. Everybody gets mad. If you say you don't get angry, you're lying. So now you've got two problems. <laughs> you're an angry liar. <laughs> so uh, anger is a reality. And what God is trying to tell us is that He put this emotion, this, this, this power in us, and recognizing it, He wants us to be weary that when we get angry, that we hit the brakes, slow down. Don't let the impulse of your anger destroy your integrity, ruin your testimony. Be angry, but don't sin. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. When you get mad, get over it. Don't sleep on it. Don't get up with it. Resolve it before the day closes. Maybe that's why he said live one day at a time. You know, it's very easy to come up with these little quips and quotes and they get catchy and they wind up on Facebook and bumper stickers and t-shirts. But I want you to know that God taught us how to deal with anger. He said, His anger is but for a moment. Translation, God gets angry, but He gets over it real quick. And so that's what I want to talk to us about today. I want to talk to us about writing our final chapter. Writing our final chapter. God bless you. You may be seated today. It's always a joy to come and be with you. And, of course, my, my favorite son, Brother Wolf, I love him dearly. And he's a great pastor. He's doing a great job. Amen. Amen. And Sister Plymouth and I love the Wolves very much. And we're very proud of what they're doing here. And we're happy that they love us enough to let us keep coming around in our old age. Kind of like an old penny, you know, just keep turning up. And... Uh, Anger. Uh, the setting of the sun has symbolized the ending of the day. That is what's become the norm. The scriptures indicate by the reading of this particular verse that we may have fluctuation and variation and even vacillation, opposition and contradiction all in one day. These things are reality. 
And during the morning hours, sometimes at noon, and the worst of all is just before quitting time, things happen that bring us to a state of anger, frustration, irritation. And so when wrath becomes a part of our day, the Bible tells us that before that day closes, before you lay your head down to sleep, it would behoove you to make things right, correct these things, at least address them, so that the next day is not continued badly, <laughs> come on, in error or in anger. Someone once stated that entrances are brief, but exits are eternal. It's an overlooked reality of, of life is that you will not be remembered for what you did as much as for how you left. James Kilgore used to tell a powerful story about a young man who was asked to preach one Sunday morning. And he was quite excited and full of himself. And he came strutting in like the man of the hour and when he got through preaching, it hadn't gone very well. And so he got the people to stand and lift their hands. And while they were worshiping, he slipped out the side door and disappeared. And the uh, pastor got up and said, you know, if he would have come in like he went out, he could have went out like he came in. <laughs> and so uh, the, the PowerPoint is this. Read the room. Know what you're at. Know what stage of life you're in. There are times when your youth will be excused. But then there comes times when people look at you and realize that, hey, you ought to know better. In fact, sometimes they'll even say to you, you do know better. And the truth is that oftentimes knowing better does not mean that we are automatically do better. Many times our anger, our emotions run away with us and we make decisions based on where we are in a moment, in a flash, in a second, never realizing that these results will endure and cause us pain for the rest of our lives. Jesus said, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And he wasn't talking about enduring in anger. He was talking about enduring in peace. Come on, somebody make your mind up that life's too short. It's not, it's not worth it to go around mad all the time. I, uh, I had a time in my life when, uh, I'll be honest with you, I really think that I suffered with what I would call a spirit of anger. I just stayed mad all the time. It didn't take much to make me mad. And, uh, you know, I'd say I'm one of those guys that will fight at the drop of the hat. And a lot of times I drop the hat. And uh, that's just who I was. Uh, and, and thankfully, God saw fit to put a man in my life that challenged me and put up a roadblock. and said, hey, you've got to address this. And we prayed about it and we did address it. And so I want you to know that I'm not preaching some ethereal, wondering thing out here. I'm talking about a life. You can overcome anger. You can learn to control yourself. You can learn to throttle yourself. Everybody say, we've got to do it. And I'm talking about writing the final chapter. Just because it started poorly doesn't mean it has to end poorly. How many times have I said, come on, a bad childhood does not have to mean a bad life. There's too many success stories. Oh, and listen, media, if it does nothing else, if our technology does nothing else, at least it brings to bear and brings to availability the stories of, hey, not everybody goes that way. Some people do succeed. Some people do overcome. Some people do rise up. And so the prophet Jeremiah chapter 8 and verse 20 wrote these words. He said, the harvest is past. The summer is has ended, and we are not saved. That's where I want to take you today. I want to take you to a place where you will honestly, pure-heartedly look, come on, with an unvarnished eye at reality in your own life. 
This is your story. I'm writing my story. You're writing your story. And I am begging you today to put the pen in the hand of the author and the finisher of your faith. Let God rewrite, come on, the final chapter of your life. It does not have to end this way. In Haggai chapter 2 verse 15 we find these words. And now carefully consider. From this day forward he declares. From before stone was laid upon stone in the temple of the Lord. Since those days when one came to a heap of twenty ephahs. And there were but ten. When one came to the wine vat to draw out fifty baths from the press. And there was just twenty. So everybody say a shortness. Come on, we're talking about a time of, of lack here. He said, I struck you with blight and mildew and hell and all the labors of your hands. God said, listen, I brought correction into your life. Whew. Yet you did not turn to me, says the Lord. I've come to challenge somebody in this room. When you stop and say, why am I going through this? Why is this happening to me? God, why am, listen to me. It's not without purpose. God brings challenge. God brings a day of trial. God brings a day of judgment into our personal lives to get our attention, to help us know, hey, you need to stop and talk to me. You need to, you. Consider now from this day forward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it, he says. Is the seed still in the barn? Is that the problem? Come on, did you forget to sow? Come on, did, I'm just trying to help somebody. Come on, you know, you've plowed. The ground is ready. The seed's available, but it's still laying. Come on, dormant in the barn. Hey, I'm trying to tell you that this is the day when we need to pull out all the stops. Quit thinking about the rainy day. The rainy day's come and gone. Summer's just about over. If you're going to reap a harvest, you've got to sow now. Come on, you, you say, well, Brother Pluth, it's not a good time to sow. Yeah, but the deal is, it's not a good time for anybody. So the guy that goes ahead and sows in spite of the storm, in spite of the wind, in spite of the trouble, listen, when the day settles and the harvest comes, you'll have the only harvest in town. Everybody else's seed will be in the barn and you'll have fruit. And your fruit will be more valuable than it could have ever been at any other time. No, I'm just trying to help somebody. Don't let the condition of our day, don't let the condition of our world, don't let the atmosphere of this culture keep you from being a Christian and reaching out and loving people. If there's ever been a time to sow the gospel, it's now. So, oh, I, can't, I, I can't get off track here. As yet, the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have not yielded fruit. But from this day, God says, I will bless you. What day? The day that you turn and consider him. I've come to tell everybody in here. I, I'm preaching so good right now. Listen, it's never too late to change. I know, come on, most of us in here gray-headed. Man, I'm too old. I am what I am. It's just the way I am. It's easy to say that. I'm just the way I am. Yeah, we know you're just the way you are. But it's not too late to change. You can get up and pray. You can. I'm just trying to help you now. You can rise up and get up on the other side of the bed. Everybody say it don't got to end like that. In the morning of your life, you may have blown it. In the noonday, come on, of your journey, you may have missed the mark badly. <laughs> You've done some things that you're not proud of. I know I have. You've done some things that were less than pleasing to God. I realize that's a reality. And now the sun's beginning to sink and it's growing low in your life and you see the end coming. But it's not too late to rewrite that final chapter. I... Uh, I was especially intrigued. I began to study the idea of authoring. In fact, they're really pushing me to write a book, and I made the decision yesterday. I have, I have put things in order. I have started the process. I am going to write some things down. Because if it isn't written down, it's forgotten. That's the reality of it. And even when it's written down, it's often overlooked. Oh, I'm preaching so good right now. But listen to me. Even though the sun is setting... It ain't too late. It ain't too late. 
You can repent today. Come on, you can make that phone call this afternoon. I'm telling you, you've been estranged. You had not spoke to somebody in 20 years. It's never too late to write that letter. Do not let the enemy destroy the hope of your future. Stop what you're doing and correct some things. Everybody say, I do not. Come on, say it. I do not. Even if you're not, I'm, I'm just, just say it for saying it. Say, I do not want to end this way. The devil wants you to believe that it's over. That the period has been replaced and the end has been etched. But it's not over. If you're still breathing, there's still time for a rewrite. Come on, if you're here today, there's still time. Come on for a rewrite. God, listen, there's no redos, but you can rewrite. Come on, you can rewrite how this story is going to end. You can decide today. Come on, this story just took a turn. Don't just ride off into the sunset carelessly. Come on, effortlessly. Just shrugging your shoulders. Oh, well, it is what it is. I hate that statement. It may be is what it is, but it don't have to be. You can change these things. If you're wondering what I'm talking about today, I'm talking about your life. I'm talking about your marriage. I'm talking about your ministry. I'm talking about your walk with God. I'm talking about your revival. I'm talking about your dream and your vision and your hopes. I'm talking about your family. We have time. We have time to fix this. Don't settle for the what is. Make your mind up today. I'm going to do my part to rewrite the final chapter of my life. John knew Jesus. They were cousins. Maybe you remember the story with me. When, 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 when his mother came into the presence of Mary, the mother of Jesus, and, 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 and she said, he leapt in my womb. There was, there was a recognition. Come on, in, in the infancy, before they were even born, there was a knowing. Uh, and, and, and so uh, he, he, knew, he knew Jesus in the desert. Uh, he knew Jesus at the Jordan. Come on, he knew Jesus from the prison. And he knew Jesus in paradise. John literally was in the process of being boiled in oil. Now, if you don't know what that means, he was being fried alive. And when being fried alive didn't kill him, they finally decided, him, let's just hide him on the backside of nowhere on a place called Patmos. We'll just leave him out there to die. And so here is John who has literally been fried alive and has been isolated on the Isle of Patmos all alone, bitter and broken. But you know what he said? He said, I ain't dying like this. This ain't the way the last chapter's going to go down. They're going not going to write down that John rode off into the sunset of his life on the Isle of Patmos. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get in the spirit. And he said, I, John, heard the voice like it was thunder. Come on, saying, come up a little bit higher and he began to show me the end of all things why because I was in the spirit on the Lord's day I've come to tell everybody in this room come on you may feel like you've been burned mm. You may feel like you've been spurned, but you can get in the Spirit today. You can get in the Holy Ghost today. And God can rewrite the final chapter of your soul. You can still do something worthwhile. I'm just trying to help somebody. If you can still talk, come on, if you can still talk. You can still be a witness. Uh, come on, if you still got breath to breathe, you can speak a word of faith into the life of a young woman, a young man. J.T. Pugh once told me, he said, you need to find you some young men with some tomorrows. He said, I'm an old man. He said, I don't have many tomorrows left. He said, you need to find you a group of people that's got some tomorrows. And he said, when you infect their life, when you impact their life, you've impacted tomorrows, tomorrows, tomorrow. I've come to rise and say, do not die in your today until you have impacted your tomorrows. Speak to your children. Speak to your grandchildren. Write them a note. Send them a letter. Make a call. Do something to remind them. It doesn't got to end this way. If you want the preacher to say good things over your casket, 
You've got to make some decisions today. Samson said, I might be bound. I might be bruised. I might be blind. But Lord, go ahead and anoint me. One more time. You talk about rewriting the story. Somebody help me preach right now. Blinded, bruised and broken. He stepped up and God said his greatest victory was his final victory because he chose not to let it end that way. The thief on the cross, listen, he had, he had a cheering section. Oh, come on. Don't hear this, listen. And he said, wait a minute. Wait a minute. We belong here. He does not. We, we did this. We, this is our just punishment. But this man is innocent. And he looks at God and he says, Hey, whatever you do, remember me when you come into your kingdom. You talk about the last chapter being rewritten. Jesus said, Hey, don't you worry, son. You're going to be with me in paradise this day. I'm telling you, I rebuke the devil's lie that suggests because you messed up in the morning, come on, you missed it in the noon hour, that somehow your evening can't come up right. I'm telling you, God, come on, is a God of the last inning. God is a God of the last out. God is a God of the final hill. God is a God of the last valley. God will bring you through. Come on, God wants to rewrite the end of your story. Joshua, Joshua under the hand and direction of Almighty God was elevated into a place of leadership. and God gave him an impossible task to fight an enemy he was not equipped to destroy, to fight an army that he was outgunned and outmanned, put him in an unworkable situation and then began to give him victory. And in the middle of his victorious moment, he ran out of time. Oh, the Bible said that he looked and he realized the sun was beginning to set behind that hill. And he said, wait a minute, God, I'm enjoying this. Wait a minute, God, we're not through here. Wait a minute, God, this is going the way it's supposed to go, but I'm about to be out of time, God. I need a little more time. And he's turning around and he rebuked that sun and told it to stand still. Whoo! You talk about rewriting the final chapter. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall in heaven that day. Can you imagine the angelic host watching out over the balcony of heaven going, oh, look at this, man, look at this. My God, would you, did you ever see anything such as this? And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, they hear that cry from the earth. Hey, I need some time. Son, stand still. I can hear Michael telling Gabriel, well, we ain't never done that before. Well, that's never going to happen. And all of a sudden, he hears the voice of heaven clear in his throat. <clears throat> Master, go stop that son. Cause everything to stand still. Whew. The Bible said, and the son stood still. Not for a second. Not for a minute. Oh, no, no. Hours. <laughs> Scientifically, they say that little moment in time is still missing on the timeline of the history of our planet. I've got news for you. It's never too late to ask God for a little more time. Oh, come on, you know the story well. Oh, Hezekiah, come on, he was dead and dying. God even sent the prophet by to tell him, hey, you're right, it's over. You're not getting out of here, you're done. But he turned his face to the wall and with tears streaming, he said, but wait a minute, God. Remember the mercies and the promises that you made to David. God, do you remember that I've done everything you asked me to do? I've walked in the, yeah, Lord, please, God, remember. And God did remember. And he stopped the prophet before he could get out of the hallway and said, whoops, my bad. Go back and tell him, 15 years. I saw his tears. I heard his prayer. I'm going to extend his life. 15 years. I'm telling you right now, I'm not asking God for 15 more. I, I'm just telling you, uh, be, getting old's for the brave. You know that. I'm looking at you. Stuff quits working. Pains are magnified. Pain pills don't work anymore. Come on. People don't care. <laughs> the phone quits ringing. Come on, the mail dries up. Listen to me. 
But when you're facing death and you have unfinished business, come on, you're going to say, God, I need one more day. I need one more altar call. I need one more message. I need one more preaching. I've come to tell somebody, God brought you in this room today and he appointed me in this moment, in this hour, to remind you it ain't too late to ask God to change the end, to rewrite the finish line. Come on, God, I don't want it to end like this. Clap your hands and shout, yes, I'm trying to hurry now. Woo! We have no influence on how it begins. We have no say in where it starts. Our birth is made without our input. Our parentage is by random selection that we have no say in. We are born, come on, we are reared, we are raised. Much of our early life is controlled by others. And if the government had its way, it would control us to the grave. But I'm telling you, in this moment, in this hour, you've come to a place where God's bringing into your reality and your thinking this very moment. You have more to say with how it ends than when it began. I can't fix yesterday. I can't rewrite yesterday. What's been done has been done. What's been said has been said. But I can tell you now, the power of the pen is in the hand of the author. And I am the author and the finish of your faith. And if you will let me, I will empower you today. Come on, to rewrite the way this is going to close. I'll help you rewrite the way this is going to finish. You can win. You can go out on top. Come on, you can. If you didn't like what happened in the morning, don't sit on it. Don't ruminate in it. Come on, don't, don't accept it. Come on, if the noonday hadn't been to your liking, rise up and say, God, we're going to change some stuff today. See, that's the problem with mankind. Mankind starts with light and goes to darkness. I've preached that sermon here. I'm almost certain of it. But that ain't how God works. God goes from darkness to light. The book of Genesis is very clear that the evening, whew, are you listening to me? The evening and the morning were the first day. Listen to me. You've got to understand something. God does not want you to dwell in darkness. God does not want you to die in darkness. He wants you to arise and stand before Him in the brightness of your noonday and say, God is on my side. Come on, joy cometh in the morning. It's going to be, it always looks better in the light of day. I'm telling you, I'm not going to let my day end with the sunset. My day's going to end with the sunrise. Come on, I'm not going to die laying down. I'm going to die standing up. I told somebody two days ago, they asked me about how I thought it was all going to end. I said, buddy, there is no retirement in my vocabulary. I plan to die in the pulpit. I'm telling you right now, I want my last word to be hallelujah over here and come on, yeah, over there. I want God to give me an exit, come on, that is marked by victory. I want to go out on my feet. Come on, as the old cowboy said, I want to die with my boots on. I'm not planning on quitting. I got news for you. The devil fell and cannot get up. And his goal is to take you with him. He hates the fact that no matter how many times you fall, no matter how low you go, you can still get back up again. Come on, the prophet wrote it in chapter 7 and 8. Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy, for when I fall, I shall arise. And when I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. Everybody say it came in this way. Snide remarks, cutting words, humiliation, deception. Come on, broken hearted. If you have a backslidden child, don't sit on it. Don't let that stand. It's not over. The sun hasn't set yet. You can still make that call. You can still help them restore their marriage. You can still help them rise above, come on, the trouble of their day. It's simply not over. It's just not going to end this way. If you never make it back home, 
If you never make that phone call, if you never speak those words of forgiveness and love, if you never take time to talk to that wayward child, come on, that, that backslidden grandkid, is that the way you want it to end? A lady was standing in the rain. Her automobile had broken down at the worst possible moment. A taxi came by and stopped and picked her up. She quickly rattled off an address of a hospital and said, please get me there as fast as you can. The cabbie took it to heart, drove with haste, took her to that hospital, never realizing who she was or what he was doing. But about a week later, there was a knock at his door. The delivery man had come by uninvited, had a box for him. It was a box of the best stereo equipment money could buy. It was the top grade, highest end sound system. And in the package was a package of recordings. And it was all of the music and singing of a fellow by the name of Nat King Cole. With it was a note, thank you so very much. When you picked me up out of kindness that day and rushed me to that hospital, my husband was one hour from slipping into eternity. And it was my goal to get there so he didn't have to die without me. I didn't want it to end with me not being there. So this is me saying thank you, Mrs. Nat King Cole. He did not know that he had picked up a famous human, and delivered her to the most signature moment of her most loved partner. I've come to tell you, it doesn't have to end this way. God will make a provision if you'll ask. I present to you the realities of life in four areas. There are four areas where you need to put significance and energy so that it ends well for you. You need to invest your time and treasure wisely. Regardless of who we think we have become or who we think we are or how many platitudes or pats on the backs or how large the crowd gathers. At the end, there's going to be four people that are going to be important and critical that you've invested your time in. First is God. I assure you, at the end, God will be there. Make absolute certain. Be so absolutely sure that you have taken care of your relationship with God and made it a priority. God doesn't need to be number one on a list. He needs to be on his own page. Don't let God get lost in the clutter of life. Make God, come on, separate and distinct in his own right. Everything else comes after I take care of my relationship with God. Secondly, secondly, your companion and your children. They will be there. Make sure that you nurture the relationships of your loved ones. You can have friends. You can have buddies. Come on, you can have saints and you can have brothers and sisters. But there's nothing at the end like those children that you birthed and reared and brought through this life. Third, memories. Everything you've ever done. Every word you've ever said. God said we're going to be held accountable for our words. How important is it now? That you take a few minutes and reflect back. And maybe there's a phone call that you should make. A thank you note that you didn't write. Is anybody going to help me preach right now? Maybe there's that apology that never quite got made. I'm not talking about sending them a big Christmas gift and thinking it's going to be okay. They need to hear the words, I was wrong. I need you to forgive me. I'm sorry needs to come out of your mouth before you die. It is important. Finally, finally, fourth and finally, throughout the course of life, I need to recognize that the fourth person to consider, the fourth person that's going to be there, 
is myself. You're going to be there at the end. And so this is the climax. This is the conclusion. Break time's coming. But you need to make sure that you live your life in such a way that at the end you've become someone you can live with. Because you're going to be there. And if you can't live with who you've become, then today's the day to pick up that pen and put it in the hand of the master craftsman and say, Lord, I need you to do a little rewrite. God, I'm going to need you to change a few things at the close of this life. Stand with me. Writing the final chapter. Great books often, as powerful as they are, as complete as they may seem, when the author finishes and he reads it in its entirety, he determines that it's not just quite what he intended. and There's a little misunderstanding if you don't know the back story and People may not quite understand exactly what happened there and you've left them hanging on the end of a cliff and they're going to want to know, but what happened to... And so they've come up with this, this tool and the gift and the art of positing one's thoughts. At the beginning they write prologue. Prologue is where they tell you what you need to know so you can get the full flavor of the story. In the beginning, God said, let there be light. In the beginning, somebody get ready to help me now. In the garden, God said, I'm going to put in between thee and the woman's seed. You're going to bruise his heel, but he's going to bruise your head. So when you're reading that life story and it looks like it's terrible, it looks like it should have never happened, it looks like God what in the world happened here, you just know, hang on. This may be a cliffhanger, but the conclusion's coming. The heel's getting ready to fall on the forehead of the enemy. Come on, the devil's getting ready to eat some dirt. God seeks to turn this thing around. Prologue. Then then you put that end on the story and that exclamation point that period that little slash under the final words you sit back and you think about it and your editor writes it and reads it and you read it and you back and rewrite it and you and then when it's all said and done you think there's just no way to fix it it's too much work let's just write let's just write epilogue Epilogue is the things you need to know after the fact. Whew. Can I tell somebody? Oh, it looked bad. He's in the ground. It's been about three days now. They beat him. Come on, they spit on him. They Come on, they, they mocked him. They stabbed him. They cut him. Come on, they, they, they bled him out. Whew. They wrapped him up. They throwed him in a barred tomb. But three days later, come on, the sun turned dark. For nine hours in the middle of the day, God blotted his face out. Come on, but then, but then, but then, the earth quaked. The stone rolled away. And out he came. Come on, victorious. Come on, when you serve a God like that, who has the power of the pen, it's never too late. It's never too late. I'm going to close with this story. I know you're standing and we're going to pray, but I was preaching. Well, I wasn't actually preaching. It was the worship service. San Diego, Brother Art Hodges Church, Chula Vista, California. There was a family there that that I had worked with and prayed with for several years. And they had become fans of my Ignite the Fire ministry and had been a part of it. And, and uh, so when I came back that particular Sunday, I saw them and waved at them. And, and uh, they introduced me to a little white-haired lady. 
She was about this tall. Her hair was white. I mean, I'm talking white, 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 white. Beautiful head of hair. And little, little, small, unassuming, quiet little lady. And so during the worship service, they gave the appeal to come down and pray. And so I watched the son help his mother, and they got her down to the front. She was standing there with her little hands in the air. And, of course, I didn't know too much about her. I knew it was, you know, his mother. And so I started praying with her. Well, when I started praying with her, I got in her ear, and I said, Mother, it's not too late. God's fixing to fill you with the Holy Ghost. You're going to speak in tongues. Sounds that you don't recognize are coming into your mind. Trust yourself. Open your mouth. Let your tongue have those sounds. And when I laid hands on her, she began to speak in tongues. And when I looked back, her son standing behind her, he had both hands in the, on her shoulders, just kind of supporting her. Tears were literally running off his chin. And I looked and his mouth was moving. And this is what he was saying. It's never too late. It's never too late. 84 years old. She had lived her entire life in the city of New York, New York. She was a devout Catholic. She had never been to a Pentecostal church in her life. And she fought them until they finally had to force her to move to San Diego with them because of dementia, the onset of dementia. And with a limited mental capacity, God drew her to that altar and filled her with His Spirit. And they baptized her in Jesus' name at 84 years old. It's never too late to put the pen in the hand of a ready writer. If God can save 84-year-old, mentally challenged little ladies at the prayer of a beloved son, I think God could save some beloved sons and daughters and grandsons and granddaughters and great-grandsons and great-granddaughters. It's never too late to rise up today and put the pen in the hand of the author and the finisher of our faith. Imagine with me, if you will, <laughs> drug out to the edge of the city, despised and brutally handled by the men of that day. In the height of their arrogance and their anger, they determined that they was going to end it once and for all. The first stone took him to his knees. And then one stone fought another till literally his body was bruised and broken under a pile of stones of anger. As the crowd began to disperse and walk away, the Holy Spirit of Almighty God slipped back into the form of the Apostle Paul and he began to push stones away. And he began to come on, do you hear me now? Because it's never too late to put your hand in the hand of the ready. Listen to me. You talk about rewriting the final chapter. He got up and kept preaching. And revival was the result. It's never too late. Come on, would somebody lift up their hand right here? How about it? Would you lift up your heart right here? Come on, I believe God's getting ready to speak into Arashande. Shakaya. I speak boldly to those watching online, those that will see at a later date. Don't be afraid to stop what you're doing and lift up your hands in this moment. It's not too late for you either. It won't be too late a week from now, a month from now, a year from now. When you hear this word of hope, rise up and say, I refuse to let the last chapter end this way. God, I want you to rewrite the end of my story. I give you what's left of my story. Write as you please. Write as it seemeth good unto you. In those hours when life don't make sense, don't try to make sense of the tragedy. Just ask God to rewrite the final chapter. God bless you today. It's been a joy to be with you. Let's take a break. I'll see you at 11 o'clock.
まあまあ。